Hello, I am That Weems Guy here for First Person Safety, and joining me today, you may remember him from our origin story episode, Caleb Causey. How you doing, Caleb? Howdy, folks. Caleb, tell them everybody who you are. Uh, I'm Caleb. <laughs> and what do you do, Caleb? <laughs> I go places and I do things. There you go. No, uh, no I'm Caleb Causey, and uh, I run... I'm the owner director of training for Lone Star Medics. Lone Star Medics is a field and tactical medical training company and consulting, uh, and we offer consulting services. Uh, but uh, spent the past, uh, oh, been a medic involved with field or tactical medicine for a little over 20 years now and uh, been teaching, you know, started up Lone Star Medics uh, for 11 or 12 years now, whenever 2009 was. I lost count after 2020. I don't understand math anymore. Uh, much of anything after 2020 but well, the, the world ended in 2020 so nothing else matters but i hope not because that means i gotta start over all right <laughs> but uh since 2009 been uh, teaching folks uh field and tactical medicine of various degrees and levels um and uh we travel around the u.s doing that and uh that's 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 me and uh prior to all of that for a little while in his life caleb played army in a little place called the balkans <laughs> Some yes, of you, yes. you know, um, go, go get on was, Wikipedia and look up Balkans and see yeah. what happened there. Two deployments to the Balkans. As I did four years of active duty as a combat medic, um, stationed in uh, Europe for two years. During those two years, deployed twice to the Balkans, Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, um, different units like the 212th MASH, uh, uh, the 82nd, um, and then the Op 4 unit there at uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, so, uh, Spent uh, after that, spent about six years as a volunteer firefighter EMT um, at a local fire department and uh, various things there. Spent six years um, on the SWAT team as the primary lead medic. Um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think. It's uh, enough that I've forgotten of the jobs I've done as a mm -hmm. medic, as embarrassing as that is. All right. <laughs> For those of you in the audience who are not familiar with the Balkans, we had very high level units that left the Balkans to go to Afghanistan in response to 9-11, if that tells you how serious of a place the Balkans is. Yeah, a lot of good days, bad days. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm glad I got out of there. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, the current generation seems to all be about global war on terror. Well, we were fighting the global war on terror in the Balkans when 9-11 yeah, happened. Side, yeah. Modern day genocide, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah that Milosevic guy was pretty much uh, a bad guy. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. So, yeah. um, there's a lot of bad stuff going on over there, and uh, that's still going on. And it's still uh, uh, the results of those uh, of those wars, the civil wars, um, are still being felt today. Yeah. So a lot of uh, a lot of good people doing good work over there, though. And a lot of the locals are doing really awesome work, too. Sure, sure. Well, you know, the original intent of this whole accidental show was, because this, this whole thing is an accident, uh, the original intent of this show was to create a library of resources for current and prospective firearms instructors. And so that's what the intent of most of the episodes has been, is to create a library of resources. And I wanted Caleb to come on here today to talk about range response plans. And I, Caleb, I got, a, I got a situation for you that I need to outline and see if, you've, if this is familiar to you. I was in a class with a very, very, very good instructor. And we're doing the, the safety brief at the beginning of class. And the instructor you know, throws out that question to the students. Hey, does anyone in here have medical training beyond first responder and a guy raises his hand and says i do i'm a doctor and the instructor said well great you're our chief medical guy for the class and the student said well i'm a forensic pathologist so i won't be able to fix anybody but i'll be able to diagnose how they died you're hired <laughs> yeah you're our guy. and i looked over at him i said okay whatever would end up in that death thing stop it yeah let's Let's. <laughs> oh, Lord. Stop it. So, you know, 
that's not a bad question for instructors to ask during the safety briefing is who has what training, et cetera. But, you know, it does raise the question of if I've got a podiatrist, an oncologist or something along those lines, or an ER nurse, which one's going to be better suited to handle a trauma situation on the range? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, that's what kind of the, the other day when you and I were talking about it offline and uh, then the phone call, it's uh, kind of stirring the pot. It, you know, we, we I, you know, you've seen it, I've seen it when we've been on at the different, uh, no matter if he's on or off the range, at different events, if you're doing something, there's always a safety brief of, okay, here are the safety mm-hmm. rules, but then what are our contingencies and SOPs and the plan of actions once something does go wrong? Right. Um, so it's not, you know, we need to be prepared and plan for, anticipate and expect something to go wrong. Have Murphy's Law show up with a lot of drama every time. And if Murphy's Law doesn't show up and Murphy don't show up, then fine. Okay. Right. Great job. You know, but uh, things get complicated real quick when we don't plan for those contingencies and we think, oh, we'll put it on somebody else. Um, and that's kind of what, you know, you and I were just talking about, you know, before this is, hey, what are some things, you know, that's what I think you want to talk about today is what are some things, you know, a couple of bullet points, pun, pun intended, <laughs> that we could talk about uh, before we, you know, send that first round down range? What are some things we need to talk about from not just a shooter's perspective, um, but also or a student's perspective, but also as a professional instructor? If you're claiming yourself to be a professional instructor, then sure. OK, then then be professional. You know, you don't rely upon somebody else to uh, teach your curriculum or to, you know, not sure you can't be a subject matter expert on everything. And I'm not saying you have to be a, a thoracic surgeon uh, or an ER surgeon doctor to handle gunshot wounds on a shooting range. OK, um, and I'm not saying we're not going to utilize other assets, even if they are students either. Uh, I'm just saying let's have our initial plan, um, create a, a formidable, a formidable plan and if there's, you know, we have to pull some audibles during that plan, then fine. Okay. Hey, understandable. Uh, we'll be like Gumby and f- be, stay flexible. Um, and that's, a, you know, I think you're wanting to talk about today, correct? Uh, yes. Yes. So what are some pre-class things that instructors should be doing? Sure. First thing I would say is uh, they need to have some type of medical training. I'm not saying they have to go to med school or even, even EMT school or paramedic school. Okay. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying like, hey, at minimum, be current on CPR and how to use an AED, an automated external defibrillator. Um, Two, at minimum, bare minimum, have a stop the bleed class under their belt. And I'm a huge advocate for stop the bleed. I'll, you know, promote it and advocate it for right now. All of you all watching this right now, even if you've already taken a stop the bleed class within the past 12 months, if it's or if it's been after 12, been a year, go take it and get a refresher folks you haven't taken a stop the bleed class yes go take them they're usually about two hours long usually fairly inexpensive or most of them are free Um, you get them at local hospitals fire departments schools police departments put them on Um, but a stop the bleed program at least help you how to put on a tourniquet that will teach you how to put on a tourniquet how to apply a pressure bandage and how to pack a wound that's it so there are some you know pros and cons to it all um, but, uh, I'm not saying you have to go take a T triple C class. No, if yes, if you're a medic working in there, a corpsman, uh, in the military in combat operations, yes, you probably needed some of the T triple C curriculum under your belt, but if you're not that person and you're a, you know, fire instructor on a shooting range, none of that stuff, not a lot of it's going to be really applicable. So keywords, there are context and applicability when you're training in any subject, you know, if I'm studying you know, about elephants, well, then I probably don't have to really worry about hydrodynamics and, of you know, hydraulic fluid or whatever, you know, nuclear energy, <laughs> probably not really related. <laughs> um, but uh, I would say training first, go get a stop the bleed class, preferably. Um, I love people to be in, you know, we created a, one of our first classes we taught. In fact, the first class I ever taught was to a bunch of range safety officers. Um, some buddies out there at TAC Pro Shooting Center, they said, hey, now that you're a big shot instructor, uh, when I went to paramedic school, they recruited me as an adjunct instructor, sent me to instructor level classes uh, to state and national level. And uh, it is fast and furious. But then 
they came back home and they, you know, Bill Davison said, Hey, why don't you teach uh, the RSOs a class? I pulled eight hour class out of my hat and range response is one of our, you know, it's a one day class, very popular course. Now it's obviously evolved over the years since right. 2009. Um, but the idea of having, Hey, not just, okay, someone assigned to it, we need to have a plan. So having some type of training, uh, whether it's a Lone Star Medics class or one of my quote unquote competitors or my colleagues, my buddies classes, uh, there's several of us out there doing it. Uh, just make sure it's, it's contextual to what you're trying to do. Um, so I'd say get some training in your, in your belt because that's going to open up the door to a lot more of the things. You're going to know what the next question is always asked. Well, what should I carry with me? And I'm sure everybody watching this is waiting for Kayla to spill the beans about, well, just tell me what I should carry. Uh -huh. I'm like, well, do you know how to use it? That's like the equivalent <laughs> for us, a shooter saying, your buddy saying, hey, I'm thinking about getting a gun. What, should, what kind of firearm should I get? And you're like, well, what's your first question you're going to ask them? Well, if someone asks you, hey, a buddy, a, you know, a, a non-shooter says, hey, I'm thinking about getting a firearm. What kind of gun should I get? What's the first question you're going to ask them? What are you going to do with it? Because context matters, right? Right. Okay. Right. If you tell them, I need to, I'm going to be doing surgery in the jungle. Okay. So that medical gear is going to be a little different than hey, I'm going to be spending the weekend at a three-gun match. Right. All right. A little bit of um, context. All right. And, yeah, I know the natural inclination <laughs> when we start talking about medical on a range is for people to start thinking about bullet wounds. Um, you alluded to it earlier, talking about CPR and AEDs, cardiac issues, Heart, these, yeah. these things. Uh, I've dealt with several heat emergencies on ranges. I, I, yeah, again, and everybody, everybody knows me. Oh, great. Here it goes about dehydration. Um, I've dealt with, yeah, is it really water? Mm -hmm. And then two, why is he drinking vodka out of a plastic cup? <laughs> yeah. Let alone vodka. No, it's um, water. <laughs> um, hey, I, I literally have a, a canteen sitting here. Okay. Caleb, um, I can't, but, I can't, I can't hold my ice cream. I certainly am not going to get into, uh, <laughs> to the fire water. But, uh, you, the, where were we? Um, other things other than bleeding. Yeah, other things than bleeding. You know, the, the, the most common injury I've seen in my career of over 20 years as a medic has been heat-related injuries. Mm -hmm. People falling out due to uh, heat exhaustion, heat cramps, muscle cramps, um, dehydration, uh, heat stroke. I, I, you know, having soldiers die when you're in training um, because they didn't drink water sucks. Uh, that's that's a tough funeral to attend. Right. You know, you put on your your you know your class A's for that funeral. And for that ceremony, and um, you think because we get, couldn't get them to drink water, yeah. that, that's that's tough pill to swallow right there. That's a long bad day. Um, and uh, uh, you know, one of the things that goes with people when they get dehydrated is their mental clarity. And I was assisting with a class once, a shotgun class, and late in the day, hot day, a uh, guy looks down range and sees some of his range equipment like off to the side down range and his brain says, I've got to go get that right now. And he starts to walk down range to go get it. And I had to tackle him because he was about to walk into a firing line with shotguns. I'm like, no, no, we're stopping right here. We pulled him off, put him in the shade, started to drink water, everything and, and made sure he was okay. But, uh, um, you know, there are things that are more important well, not necessarily more important, but other contingencies. Sure. And, uh, so oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. but yes, yeah, those contingencies for just heat stroke, I mean, gunshot wounds are fairly simple to deal with to, to some degree. Okay. Right. All things being equal. Um, but, uh, you you know, but just like you said, bee stings, you know, for an outdoor range, even indoor range, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, people getting, uh, you know, some critter living underneath that uh, steel pepper popper that's been laying down all summer and, you know, all, all winter or whatever in spring. And you're the first person mm -hmm. to walk up and reset it. And uh, for whatever reason, that critter is living under there. So snake bites, animal bites and stings are a thing. Um, you know, how many of us have stapled our fingertips? Well, not me, because I don't allow staples on the range. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, because you know, I've yeah, seen people do or stuff. even cold weather, you know, I've yeah. been up north. Uh, yeah. You know, with Ashton Ray there at uh, 360 Performance and, you know, in Pennsylvania gets cold, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and uh, you get cold weather related injuries too. how, how are you going to, you know, shoot your pistol with gloves on? 
right. that's something you take you got to think about which gloves you're wearing how you're going to solve that problem um so that's the thing but uh, environmental emergencies is always a thing uh gunshot wounds obviously uh but then there's you know simply eye injuries people get stuff in there even with eye pro on um think about it you've got many you got little micro explosions going off real close to your face and you know it just i cringe every time i see people's videos or shooting or photos and no one's wearing eye pro and i'm like right. hey i get it if you're doing a bolt action and for whatever reason it's not you know i've done precision shooting a little bit and uh, i get it your your eye pro isn't matching up to your reticle when you're proned out i get it um but uh, at the same time we'll change up your eye you know your eye pro man right. um hearing protection you know <laughs> i don't care so much when i'm in the range of people don't wear hearing protection i don't care if they go deaf okay that's their <laughs> problem but going blind can suck and yeah. not that one's worse than the other but right. um facial trauma is a thing but uh, you know it's all in hydration all the other things is easy to prevent and it's not just drinking water it's the clothing you're wearing it's uh work and rest time periods and ratios um you know and that sort of thing but uh yeah the so back to what our thing is coming back full circle. I'd say the first thing is training. Uh, like we said, heart uh, CPR and AED, heart related disease is the number one killer in America. Nothing comes close. So the chances are you're out there on the shooting range in the public or private range, and you've got a you know group of people. Um, if you have anybody that's a male, an American male, age 35 or older, they're considered high risk for heart disease right there. So if you have any of those people in your demo, any of that demographic in your class you know, how to, knowing how to do CPR and using an automated external defibrillator should be high on your list right. of, of, of training as a firearms instructor or as a shooter on the range. Um, right. So training would be the first thing. Um, I would think things like talking with the class host, if you're traveling, a traveling instructor, you know, talk to the class host and ascertaining what the response is to the range and who is responding exactly um i mean got it in some of my notes you know one of the things that we hand you know talk about the range response classes um hey what our sop may be calling nine and one okay great well then first off let's look at where are we sending them mm -hmm. i ask students all the time i'm like two two questions i'll ask in a, in a class i'll simply say hey which way in sitting in the classroom or outdoors i'll say which way is north and if i got 10 people in the class i'll get 10 different directions that they're all pointing then you think out of 10 people, someone's going to get close. <laughs> yeah. Not all the time. Some people just say like, I have no idea which way is north. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, well, the sun has been set, rising and setting the same. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, never mind. You are aware the earth is round um, and it rotates around the sun, let alone in circles. Never mind. Too advanced for them. Uh, but just knowing direction. But two, what is the address? I ask people, to, hey, they, you drove here this morning to class. What's the address here? If we call 911 right now and I need help, can you get people here? Do you know how to get and talk them to them? No, once they're in, maybe they do. Yeah, one, two, three, Smith Lane. Great. You know the address. But now, uh, where on that range are we? Some of these outdoor, you know, outdoor ranges, even the indoor ranges, uh, they've got, uh, I've been to an indoor range where they literally had a, an, an, ele an elevator. They had a basement level that had uh, rifle ranges in it and in a basement. So I was like, you had to go down the stairs and everything. I was like, that's kind of cool. Um, and uh, two, like, hey, if we have to walk to this classroom or to this part of the shop or that part of the range or that bay, does do they know how to get there? Can they get there? Uh, there's been one shooting range here locally that the only way you can get up there, uh, get to that shooting rate is if you took a uh, golf cart. There was a bridge going over a creek. The creek was not very wide, but it was very deep. And I literally had this one uh, way to get to those bays. The easiest and quickest was to go over a bridge just wide enough for a golf cart that the range personnel used. And I thought besides that, it was it was wide enough. You know, you couldn't step across it by any means, um, you know, it's 15, 20 feet wide, uh, but it's still very deep. So just even going walking down and back up with them mm -hmm. in a litter would have proven difficult. Um, but uh, so not only is like, hey, who's responding, who's coming, who's going? Uh, things I always talk about, you know, is first off before we get part of calling 911 is, you know, in, using your uh, range response team. And that consists of, you know, stuff like who's the primary medic, secondary medic, which just backs them up. Who's the primary communications person who's going to be calling 911? Who's their backup in case they're out going to the restroom or they're eating lunch or they left early or something? Who knows? Um, 
and they're the one hurt. So who's secondary communication? Uh, third is going to be um, your evacuation liaison. Okay. So our transportation. So who's going to be in charge of driving the vehicle? It's if it's a personally owned vehicle, if we're going to go to the hospital or go meet up with EMS or drive to the landing zone on the range. Uh, they're also in charge of making sure the landing zone for the helicopter, if, if that's feasible, is set up, established, and uh, kind of controlling that. Um, so just those, you know, that's a perfect world to have all those people. You may not have those, be the luxury of all those people, but that's some jobs you need to think about. Um, you know, the primary medic shouldn't be the one calling 911. Right. They're busy. They're working. <laughs> right. And, you, you know, know the, dialing 911 is going to mean different things, different places as well. Yes. You know, I work in a county that we have typically two ambulances covering the county, but the hospitals that they're going to transport you to are in the neighboring county. So if one ambulance has already transported someone to the hospital and they're still there and the other one's at a wreck scene on the other side of the county. And we call 911 at the range, we're having to wait for them to get an ambulance free to yep. respond and that may be different in a place where they've got full-time, full service, everything going on. But you look at a city like Austin right now, Austin, Texas, that's Austin, got a 50%, Atlanta, 50, yeah, 50 shortage of EMTs right now. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing a cross public safety in general. Right. Um, you know, there's just not enough people um, to handle it all. Uh, and they're, you know, why would, I mean, I don't blame anybody in public safety right now for finding mm -hmm. a new career. I really right. can't. Though they're getting right. zero, you know, uh, support from their leadership, not to make this go off on the political rant. But um, yeah, right now, even not, when I was just talking out in the sticks or out in the country, mm -hmm. uh, major cities, right. Austin, Austin yeah. has a history of really, really, really strong uh, personnel working for them. And their their Austin EMS, uh, you know, agencies are just, I mean, they're 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 really good at training. They're really good about taking care of their people. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of one of the leading or the, the folks that we look up to in, in Texas and EMS to say, hey, well, well let's see what Austin's doing. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not saying they're without their flaws too, like anybody right. and everything, but uh, they're definitely well respected. And they're having, you know, like you said, response times are increasing. Um, so it's not just out there in the country. It's also, out, you know, in big cities. Uh, but also, too, hey, everybody talks about responding. We talked about that. Well, should we tell them it's a shooting or not? that's the other previous videos mm -hmm. um but you're you know not only that but now we've you've called 911 they're on their way uh part of that scene size up and scene safety is well hey um who's coming you'd mentioned you know e e e public safety well just because you call 911 it might be a sheriff's deputy and that's it they may not have an ambulance ready or they may not have ambulance service it may be a private sector or a private company that runs it and the county just hires them out okay um, so you need to know, okay, well, we've got to manage first off, uh, the, the shooters, the people on the range, um, as far as the scene size up part of it, uh, that includes handling those people on the range, uh, the line, uh, so your shooters, the firearms involved or whether or not they're immediately involved or up on the line, what condition do we holster or not holster? Do we lay them on the deck, uh, unload show clear? What do we, what do we want to do with them? Pros and cons to all that. It really needs to be nuked out in the little details. Uh, with blue guns beforehand <laughs> okay if you haven't thought about it, I'm not saying before every class but something you as a professional instructor should do is go through those little scenarios there with some blue guns with two or three of your buddies and say let's see what happens well no they've already proven they, they're incompetent because they just indeed themselves and someone else so do we really want them trying to unload a gun a firearm probably not okay so we play some on the deck put it on the table just leave it in a holster sling them let them hang whatever Mm -hmm. uh controlling the farms bystanders as well uh people showing up to either try to help become more of a problem and or they're trying to film it you know put in live stream it we, we're seeing here and more and more about that at car wrecks people not helping they're just filming it yep. um so that's the thing so where do you send your students do you have a rally point to send them like hey everybody go to that tree sit under that shade don't leave don't do anything don't say anything don't do anything if we i need help as the medic i'll point to you and say you the blue shirt come here do this or hey did you get 911 no they're out there they went to the restroom okay secondary you call 911 um so having that range response team set up in ahead of time so controlling the bystanders is a thing um let's see uh 
but as far as who's responding, uh, you, you got to think of it like uh, what are the response times to your location on a good day? If it's inclement, you and I, Lee, I'm sure other people have shot on a range and had a class in inclement weather. And if your plan is we're out here in the country and it's raining cats and dogs, we're going to go ahead and go on with a shotgun stage or shotgun uh, class, but it's, uh, and it's not lightning, but that doesn't mean they're going to launch that aircraft. That pilot may say, yeah, right. yep. Nope. Not going to fly. Well, then there, there's your plan of calling the bird. That ain't going to happen. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, who's coming, what is their response time to get there? Uh, what is their level of care? Or, you know, are you getting a sheriff's deputy that's uh, maybe had to stop the bleed class? Uh, or are they cross-trained as an EMT with a small jump bag? And that's it. Or are you getting a full advanced life support and an ALS unit or an uh, MICU level uh, ambulance that's going to be there? Whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes, we'll talk about that in a minute. But what is their level of care that's going to get there, is going to be able to provide once, you're, once they're there? Uh, Let's see, how long does it take them to, once they get there to take you, the patient to an appropriate facility? Uh -huh. And I said appro the closest appropriate facility, not just the closest facility, because it may be literally a veterinarian clinic. Yeah. That's not helping. <laughs> okay. Um, it may be, a, you know, if it's a um, level four, you know, in the civilian sector, it's, it's level one through four trauma centers, level one being they've got everything under the sun waiting there. And if anything can happen to human body, they can handle it right there. Uh, they have surgical capabilities. They have specialist surgeons waiting for you to get that one crazy eye injury. They can handle it there. Level four would be like, hey, they've got to call the doctor who's on the golf course on a pager and have them drive in to come see you to patch you up maybe, or to say, yep, yeah, you need to send them on. Okay, it all varies. Um, but if how long does it take them to transport you to that hospital? What level of care are you getting at that hospital? Do they have surgical capabilities? Or is it limited? Is it elective surgeries only? I mean, they have anesthesia. I mean, all those things. Uh, you know, um, how long? Uh, and you know, because they may it may be a, a leapfrog thing too. Uh, I've, we've seen that in EMS. We've taken them to the first available appropriate hospital. They kind of you know stabilize them as much as they can because they don't have a surgery surgical capability at that time. They call an ambulance or another or aircraft and transport them. You know. To downtown Fort Worth, um, so that's something to think about. Um, so, so the key plant things here takeaways are one: have a plan ahead of time as far as noting what what response is going to be. Um, you know where what you know peculiar logistical concerns may be available. You know because of your range as far as like, yeah, somebody's going to have to go guide the EMTs down the stairs you know, for yeah. that downstairs range. Uh, or I, entering the property. Right. It may be a, you know, a range locally here. It literally is a 20 minute drive um, right. from, now it's a backcountry road on a, on the right. property. Is it, and it was literally a 20 minute drive from the front gate to the shooting base. Right. I, I told you about 10 miles an hour. I helped uh, Tom Givens with a class on a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful range in Tennessee. But the road to the range was on a, hillside like this and if you drove a car you had to park at the top of the hill and put all your stuff in somebody's four-wheel drive pickup truck because you wouldn't be able to get out okay an ambulance is not going to be able to get down that road something to, think to, about. to get to get in to help treat with the patient so there's got to be a plan for getting that patient sure. out to the roadway to the ambulance and that may be, you know, through a personally owned vehicle and a four by four vehicle or something, or a, uh, you know, your, your collapsible litters and stretchers, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it may be something you've got to move the patient, maybe 10 feet to get them to where the ambulance and get them, or maybe two or three miles, right. you know, you need to know what assets you have available. Uh, the logistics, one pro tip I'll share out of class with, with here, it's not the keys to the city, but a simple thing is like, well, how do I know that? Well, you can Google earth. <laughs> That it, Google Earth is your friend. Mm -hmm. uh, you can talk to their host range, the, the host range. Uh, and you can also call the non-emergency numbers of hospitals, uh, police departments, EMS agencies, fire departments, and talk to them and say, hey, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, 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 my name's Caleb. I'm going to be out here teaching a shotgun class at this address that seems to be in y'all's district, in y'all's responding area. Uh, I just doing a little preliminary work. We're going to have about 15 people out there with us. It's going to be a little hot. And I've got, you know, 
if something happens, whether it's heat stroke or God forbid, some kind of gunshot wound, uh, how long would it take y'all to get out there? How long would it, you know, what level of care y'all bringing those? You start asking those questions. If you're traveling, then sure, it's a little bit more work to do as a traveling instructor. I, I get it. Um, but uh, if you're a traveling instructor, that means, hey, you've done this for a while. Two, uh, it's not like they call you on Thursday and say, be here Friday all the time. Uh, that uh, does happen. <laughs> I haven't gotten a phone call on Wednesday, and by Friday I was teaching. <laughs> uh, but it's far and few between. Um, but you've got time to do that. Um, and a little bit of effort up at the beginning will save your butt and save your bacon later on. Uh, so calling those, com- those people, if it's your own home range uh, and you're the, you're the range owner or you're the, it's your range that you teach at all the time, um, then, hey, not only make a phone call, I'd invite them out. Uh, you don't have to give away a free class or anything, but say, hey, we got a shotgun class coming up here in a few, in a few months. Uh, one, yeah, I'd like, you know, if you guys are at the firehouse having a, you know, your monthly meeting or something, uh, could I come out and just introduce myself? And do make it a turn into a sales pitch and right. say, hey, if you guys have, you know, literally give me two minutes, just say hello. I'm one of the farm structures of this range down the street here from y'all's uh, firehouse. And uh, by the way, um, I brought y'all some fajitas. Yeah. Enjoy. Just say thanks in two minutes of your time. If you guys would love to come down and talk to the chief and say, hey, if you if you and your people, your men and women would like, uh, let us know. We'll set up a couple of days where they can come out and get a tour of the place and do a, what we call in the Army a route reconnaissance. Right. and figure out which roads they can, are passable which ones are not you know find out get them give them a map make them a map you know and build that rapport with them and uh you show up with uh you know fajitas uh for a fire department they're not going to tell you no <laughs> yeah. and folks that kind of thing is not uncommon when new factories right. open a lot of times the law enforcement and emergency services will go tour the factory to have an idea of what's going to happen you know what sure. the layout is, uh, where do we need to come to access, et cetera. Uh, New buildings, so think, schools, yeah, well, schools, churches, yeah. office buildings. Uh, yeah, it's not a common, it's not just the fire marshal going in there, right. checking extinguishers and, you know, smoke detectors, uh, but invite to build that report with those people. So that way, the next time you do call a year from now, you know, and they're like, hey, it's, it's me, Caleb, I'm out at the range. I got somebody that's hurt. I need some help. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. It's, you're not, it's not a cold call. And there's a, not that they're going to respond any different to the stranger, but they are going to know, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. He'll have somebody at the gate. We know the gate code is this, or when we go through the gate, we go left instead of right like everybody else, and we'll get to the bays a lot quicker. Uh, you know, little details, little details that will add up. Any, um, anything that you can do that is not having to be figured out on the fly is a good thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and then as far as, uh, you know, like our beloved friend, it's no longer with us, uh, Paul Gomez said, that the key is to get – the patient, the medical gear, and the medic, all three together. Right. And that'll solve, you know, to start solving problems. Speaking uh, of which, if the trucks and the cars are all 200 yards from the range, that's not the place for your medical gear to be. It needs to be out at the firing line or on your, the instructor's person at the firing line. Sure. Uh, so if we're going to segue into gear, sure. I'll, I'll say this. Everyone wants well, to know. We're not necessarily going into all the, you need no, this not, gear, that gear, everything, but your bag 200 yards away locked in the trunk of your car is not no you need and i've been advocating this for a couple of years now but i really think and that you if you're one for firearms instructors professional or weekend warriors i don't care um we we need to have uh you need to have the medical gear on body it needs to be part of your uniform and i get it's it's hot it's a lot of gear you've got to carry a blue gun you've got to carry this you've got to carry extra ammo so you're not up there stuffing mags all the time I get it. Okay. Um, but having it on body. Okay. Uh, is going to help. Now it could be, I'm a huge fan of the, uh, of, of carrying it in a fanny pack. So your method of carry for this med kit. Okay. I'm not saying you have to carry a backpack, like a, you know, a combat medics aid bag that's weighs, you know, 30 pounds, you know, no, 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 no. You, you need, you need less than uh, half a dozen items. Okay. We're talking five or six items that are small, compact, lightweight, durable, and re- re- robust carried in something like a fanny pack uh-huh. and uh I, I know that uh i've kind of turned uh a, a couple of our buddies and colleagues our friends uh over to the dark side of wearing a fanny pack when they're teaching uh, i know paul sharp does i'll call him out you can see his instagram he's on the range he's got that fanny pack on uh-huh. okay i think he calls it a, a modular man bag or something 
but that's, that's, that's sharp for you. He is but, a uh, you know, he is John a Dobbs big does, when he's yeah. down there at KR training. Um, John yeah. Dobbs got his uh, he's he's wearing a fanny pack. Uh, Tracy Thornburg, she's wearing one of hers, or she's got it right there. Um, so the fanny pack's one option. The drop down five pouches are a good option too. Get it off, you know, your uh, weak side. Whatever it doesn't have to be a lot of a big kit, right. but carrying it on you, like you said, you don't want it in your vehicle if you're at the two hundred yard range and uh you're up there stapling targets at the 200 yard you know uh, impact zone or impact area and all of a sudden somebody gets hurt whatever it is and you're like well i gotta run 200 yards back up range to get the kit and run 200 yards back that's 400 yards that you've got to huff and puff just to get your your, your, your some medical gear um so keep the medical gear on you there's different methods of carry that's why do you go to a class that'll teach you that stuff as part of their curriculum uh, Lone Star Medics does certainly in all of our classes. The methods of carry is a big thing. How do you carry this and what you should carry? Um, but have it on you um, and then think of it in different levels. That's a big thing too. Uh, think of it as like I've got my level one kit is on body. Level two would be off body, something that's about the size of a small shoebox. Okay. Uh, and that's got your boo boo stuff. So slide by, you can handle that. You get some stuff on the eyes. You can figure out how to irrigate it. Uh, you know, your boo boo stuff and then your, hey, it's hit the fan stuff your gunshot wounds, major trauma. Um, and then maybe a few more in case, hey, uh, students racking their slide sideways, they cook a round off, goes through their arm, out this elbow, and into the guy's chest standing next to him on the left. You know, um, that <laughs> I've not witnessed it, but I've uh, had a, a close friend that has told me that about that incident. And he said, yeah, so one bullet, we ended up with two people, one with uh, an extremity injury, that was pretty simple through and through on the arm really didn't mess anything up on the bone uh bled a little bit but not bad but however it lobbed itself into the just right underneath the other guy's arm because he was up here shooting and it lobbed right up underneath his uh, armpit and his chest so now we got a sucking chest wound so that's entrance exit wound plus a sucking chest wound and another patient that'll deplete your equipment very quickly yeah uh most people think hey i just want to click by now and i just need something small and sexy and compact and cheap <laughs> um when our you know when your students are asking you in a, as a farm structure like hey what kind of farm should i get does the word you know cheap and spits my back pocket there are those two character traits that you want to hear no and that's well i got well it. i got my, my firearm on amazon yeah and exactly don't buy your medical equipment off amazon band-aids that's one thing yeah. tourniquets chest seals all that stuff no 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 get it from the source get it from uh, red Bull companies um so stay off ebay and amazon for those um uh but the equipment's got to be on you or in your level two kit would be something a little bit shoebox size uh level three would be something you'd store at home okay so it doesn't have to be a lot uh but just enough to keep your level two kit would be stuff that hey they get slide by they don't have to go to the er and stop training that could be something you get a weird tape and some gauze uh -huh. and just keep them up on the line shooting you know um they get the hot brass stuck in their collar and it creates a blister okay well let's let's cool that off <laughs> you know and uh how do we keep them on the shooting line so they continue continue training uh so be prepared for that uh you know so there's the, the the equipment you know if you have to ask what should i have for those of you watching uh well what components should we have in our kit my answer to that is one uh two part one i've never had a student that has taken at least a one one day class with me and over you know since 2009 i've never had a student ask me that question at the end of a class they know they need a tourniquet so they may ask x versus y tourniquet but they know need they need a tourniquet mm -hmm. um so if you're at if you don't know what you should put in there you probably need more training right. okay uh and uh, your instructor when you're looking out for who should uh, what you should be carrying in there should be there. Um, some instructors sell equipment. I don't. Um, I kind of like the, the being, you know, one, I don't want to deal with the retail side of it. Uh, but two, it's it's nice not to be committed to this brand. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but so your equipment needs to be with you. It can be staged. That's fine. Um, I'm seeing more and more people carrying a little bit of gear on them when they're on the shooting line as students. Uh, that's always in, in competitors. That's nice to see. Uh, so it's becoming more and more mainstream. Uh, so the equipment's one thing, the training, uh, your contingency plans. Um, and like I said earlier, when we started, you shouldn't rely upon other people to solve your problems. Like, hey, 
the safety brief is who's who's here's got some medical training okay the dentist over there huh. great now if it's sherman house yeah okay <laughs> yeah Probably who, was, be okay. who was an EMT before he became a dentist? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and by de- and by dentist we mean too. we mean a guy that can actually go in and surgically fix problems, not yeah, an actual yeah, yeah. Uh, surgeon. Yeah. We'll be fine, but he's got some uh, uh, yeah. pre-hospital medical training and experience, yeah. to say the least. Right. Uh, before he was a uh, dentist, and he's right. a lot more than just a dentist, folks. Right, you know, and um, Doc Doc Roberts, I think we'd be okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, he, he'd be, <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy with that. Yeah. Um, there's a few. We got a few buddies. Uh, right. Andy, I mean, there's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you're not always going to get an ER doctor uh, right. there in your class, you know, um, you know, or an off-duty paramedic or a mm-hmm. nurse or anything like that. Or, some, or, or Troy Miller may show up and you've got, really need a doctor there. Troy's good people, man. Um, no, but I had to. I yeah, had we to. got to name drop him in there. He'll appreciate it. Um, but uh, you know, he's going to have you know your your Troy Miller's there with you, right? You know, now it's odd because he and I are in a lot of classes together. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, it's uh, you don't rely upon that other that luxury. Someone else to solve your problem. Same thing you're teaching your students. Don't rely upon you know bless their heart the police to show up in time to solve your problem. Right? They will. They'll be helpful, and we love our police officers but they can't be there quick enough. Just like right. an ambulance can't be there right. quick enough. Tra- train students who are in the class should augment what you already have uh, put in place. Now I-, I have a frequent student who is a veterinarian. Now push comes to shove, stopping an arterial bleed on a human is not much different than stopping an arterial bleed on a, on a dog. I would say it depends on the dog. Some of them German yeah. shepherds and mouse. Right. But you know, it's still the bedside manner comes into play, right? Real right. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the actual techniques and everything really sure. aren't that different. And he always readily agrees to help with the medical plan, sure. you know, in classes. But I show up with two trauma kits and I have the ability to use them. But you've also taken some training too, right? Yeah. You didn't just go out and buy these kits, some one right. was issued to you when you took the class, I imagine. Right. Right. Uh, Because I I know your pedigree and some of the training that you've had and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, local and uh, state and federal level. And uh, so it's it's definitely you definitely bought some stuff on your own. You know, I've talked about that before. Uh, But having the kit, having the training. uh, But then, yes, if someone in the class says, hey, yeah, I've got some medical training, they can back you up. Or if it is happens to be an ER doc and they're like, hey, would you like me to handle this? Or they step in, then sure, absolutely. I have no problem. With, I'm not saying telling them, no, stand back. I, I've taken a stop the bleed two hour class. I know more than you as <laughs> yeah. an ER surgeon. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, don't, don't expect those type of people to be there, nor don't expect those, that off duty paramedic to want to volunteer to help. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, there, there's a I, big difference. Yeah. There's a big difference between someone stepping up as a good Samaritan and then someone who has a license and there are certain things called standards of care and medical protocols that they must follow and they're actually exposing themselves to more liability than Joe Schmo is. And guess what? That thoracic surgeon is not going to do anything different than what you, what Lee, the training you've had, or someone that's taken a stop the bleed class much more than that is going to be able to do. They're not going to want to go off and start whipping out scalpels and stuff and doing chest tubes out in the field. Okay. They may think they, and I'm not saying they can't, I'm just saying they probably are going to be really hesitant to do that. All right. Uh, because their livelihood, they're used to living at a certain lifestyle and they're li- used to living and ha- they've worked so hard for so many years to get to that level. Right. You know, they ain't exactly handing out <laughs> medical degrees right. out of Cracker Jack boxes here. OK, folks. Right. Um, well, well, we've, we've talked know, about it ain't the- easy to go get your RN. I mean, right. Well, you we, we know some things we've mentioned. Um, train- so- we've mentioned training numerous times. So let's tell the audience some sources of quality training. Uh, one one Lone Star Medics. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. Lone Star Medics. Um, uh, and, Archangel uh, Medical. Stop the Bleed. Yeah. I'd say look at stopthebleed.com.org. I can't remember which. That's my fault. If you um, Google Stop the Bleed, you're going to find it. You'll find it. Um, stop the Bleed. Uh, any, you know, even CPR, uh, American Heart Association. Mm-hmm. A simple CPR class you can take online and then uh, schedule your uh, skills portion. And it shouldn't take you more than an hour or two right. you know, to, to show up and do the skills at a hospital or a fire department. Right. Um, those would be phenomenal. I'd be super happy if people just took a stop the bleed class and stop the bleed class, even though I'm an instructor for it. Uh, it's still definitely a competitor of mine. 
right. it's hard to compete eight hours a couple hundred bucks or versus two hours and free um but uh stop the bleed um we talked about dr sherman house uh the civilian defender uh greg ellifritz with the uh, active response training.net that would be a great place um dark angel Josh, uh, john murphy he's mm -hmm. even got medical in his uh you know send, as added to his curriculum and he doesn't have any medical background right. but he's 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 taking a stop the bleed class or two he's taking one of mine uh he's taking a you know our medic one it's a two-day class uh so he's even implemented and we're seeing you know uh, that's the, the trend I'm glad to see that people are uh, self-defense instructors adding some, some type of medical to their curriculum. Uh, but then again, I'm part, part one of tactical medicine is neutralize the threat. Doesn't mean I'm going to go out there and start teaching edged weapons stuff and right. Right. <laughs> I'll stay in my lane, but I will say, Hey, it'd be good to know how to do a draw stroke. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Right. Kind of helpful right about now they're shooting at us. Right. Um, but, uh, uh, dark angel medical is another source. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Kerry's got a, a pretty good class there. Uh, he's a buddy. Like I said, he's a competitor, but he's also a colleague. Wow. Um, we, we joke. And we we actually think promote each other more in our own classes than we do ourselves sometimes. Uh -huh. um, we've had students that have taken both of our classes. Say, yeah, it's funny. He really ranted and raved about you, Caleb. And I'm like, mm -hmm. and then he hears it from me. He's like, yeah, that guy came to my class. He ranted and raved that you mm -hmm. said that I should go take his, that Kerry's class. So, yes. Uh -huh. um, audience i have personally trained with caleb here long star medics i have taken sherman house's uh class along these same lines i have not trained with dark angel medical uh but one of my colleagues has and speaks and he's and he is an emt and he speaks spoke very highly of what he learned at uh, at dark angels class so that's three national traveling trainers right off the bat that we can recommend and then as, as caleb has already said you have your stop the bleed and your uh American Heart Association, your Red Cross, all that kind of stuff that's, that's readily available across the country uh, for just general uh, CPR and first aid yeah, stuff. Yeah, I would say CPR. I wouldn't really recommend, and I'll say as, even mm -hmm. as a huge advocate for American Heart Association across the board, but the, their first aid portion, uh, I would, I would yeah. uh, that's not what you need. That's definitely, I would say, right. boo-boo's level. Uh, right. But for CPR, yeah, they're going to be American Heart Association is going to be the, the cutting edge on uh, mm -hmm. uh, CPR and AED training. Um, yeah. And they've got different, you know, methods of training and online and virtual and in class available. Uh, Stop the bleed. You can, you know, there's that. I mean, I could go on and list all my, you know, competitors classes here, but those would be the ones I would recommend that I even recommend to my family and friends to go take in my classes and students. Right. Um Caleb, what do you have coming up as far as classes around the country? Uh, let's see. We've got one here uh, coming up with Chuck Haggard. We've got, uh, if, you know. I know, you, I, know you've, I know you've got some counter-robbery classes coming up. We do. We've got a counter-robbery coming up uh, September, October with Daryl Bolke. Um, we're here in Dallas, and it's be a one day. We've condensed it down to a one day and uh, shorten up the ammo count. But it's uh, basically counter-robbery. It means, hey, uh, it's not necessarily a close quarters type shooting, but it's uh -huh. more of a close quarters thinking. So your right. problems are going to be really up close and personal, um, not necessarily in a clinch or anything, but arm's length or two arm's length and a lot of no shoot problems to solve. Uh, so it's a lot more critical thinking than shooting uh, on his part. And then I show you more in the TAC Med EDC, kind of a condensed version of that, of tactical medicine from a everyday carry kind of a point of view of jeans and a t-shirt. What are we carrying? How do we carry it? More importantly, how do we treat those injuries related to violent acts of violence? I've got, I've got to do it. You know what? That class will be more important than a sub-second draw. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm not going to say that medical is more important than uh, defensive shooting. Okay. Classes. Uh, but I will say this. Um, I ask my students all the time or other buddies at the range of like, Hey, how many gunfights you get into this last week mm -hmm. or this last year? Now, very few of them ever raise their hand. I said, okay, how many car wrecks did you see on your way to work this week or the way to class this morning it'd be a couple hands up so not that i'm having saying no i'm anti-gun or anything or right. anti-self-defense training um because i keep hearing you know john hearn's voice and they're saying it ain't the odds it's the stakes yeah we'll see that that class though with you and daryl okay you get to go have your range time you get to learn some some really good range skills but you also get the medical training all right, folks, that's a very good use of your time that accomplishes, you know, 
a lot. Uh, to, if we're going to quote John Hearn, that's your chocolate covered asparagus. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it took me a second. I was like, wait, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, when he said that's highlighted and underlined in my notes, right. um, that line right there. Um, uh, yeah, 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 it's you, exactly you, right. You get a lot of bang for the buck, pun intended. Right. Uh, with that, we usually, if the, we've done in this class, Daryl and I before, uh, Carl Renz hosted us out there, his place. Uh, we've done a lot there in Dallas, but it's uh, it was a two day class, but now we've condensed it down to one just to make it a little bit easier on everybody on the pocketbook and uh, for the round count. Um, I still think we're under, he's like 200, 250 rounds, I think he said, or something is what Daryl's putting out. Um, so that's not a lot. Even in one day, I doubt we're going to be shooting 300 rounds in right. a four hour session. Uh, but then at the end of the class, we are going to run everybody through a live fire scenario and uh, where you're going to have to max, you're going to have to use everything you just learned in class that day uh, to survive and prevail those, those scenario, that scenario or two. All right. Now you've got something coming up in Wisconsin as well, don't you? A similar type uh, class? In Michigan. Michigan. Okay. We're going to be up in near Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, Portage, Michigan, to be precise. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, we're going to be uh, hosted up there. There's, um, that'll be in December. We've got uh, a couple of other classes. I, I've State. been on that range. That's a very nice place to go shoot. Yeah. So uh, we're folks, go. go. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got uh, some private instruction, some private consulting uh, things here and there. So uh, one thing we did just launch, I'll share with y'all the first time publicly, really. It's been on the website now for a couple of weeks, but uh, we're, we just launched our family medical readiness program. And that's basically for those here, doesn't help everybody outside of Dallas-Fort Worth area. But if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the idea is that for two hours, I'll come to your house for a private in-home audit, training, and consulting uh, session, for lack of better terms, uh, that is uh, priced moderately well <laughs> um, and, and more than fair. And for two hours, you're getting all that. Uh, so for, pe for families, the idea is for families, uh, no more than four people in your house, just a real quick, here, here's what you have, here's what you need to work on. And here's how to do some stuff before we leave. Um, so our family medical readiness, you can read more about it on our website, but uh, we've got all of our website is updated with the, the latest classes that are 100% going on, uh, LoneStarMedics.com. Right, I know you got some other collaboratory classes scheduled as well. So go to that LoneStarMedics.com and look for that because Caleb is traveling around the country and the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area uh, for your in-home visit. And I'm sure you could get him to come to your home wherever it is. It's just gonna be, it's just going to be an expensive two-hour uh, two -hour class. It, it, yeah, it'll be. Uh, <laughs> we've got we've got a couple actually. We, we've uh, done since the elections. Right, uh, right. Folks have had us out at their house or their business, mm -hmm. um, the churches and everything. But uh, there has been a, quite a bit of private instruction for families uh, the past mm -hmm. year now. Yeah. If you want to fly him to New Hampshire for a two hour consult, I'm sure he'll do that. You'll just, you know, it's going to be. You'd be better off playing for the whole day. <laughs> yeah. to be honest. You're getting yeah. a daily rate of two hours for, for New Hampshire, but no, we do it. Uh, That's what we do. We travel yeah. and it's uh it's price. You know, it's everybody thinks, Oh, it's tens of thousands of dollars. No, it's not, mm. it's, uh, but it's uh, um, you get what you pay for. Right. You know, folks in the firearms world, we, we all preach this, you know, you got to be, participant in your own rescue you know no one's coming you've got to be able to, to to save yourself this is part of that this is very much part of that and for you as instructors that that are, are listening to this okay your responsibility to those students extends just beyond the material that you're teaching them in the range there is you know we're not saying that you have to be an ER medic, you know, yeah. ER doc and everything like that, but at least know how to put on a tourniquet, pressure bandage, chest seal, and have a plan of action in place, you know, before the class starts. Yeah. And it's, it's too simple. It's not, it's not rocket science. Right. I mean, all bleeding stops eventually, you know, come yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're all going to die eventually, but right. let's just, you know, prolong that. There you we? go. Uh, any parting shot, closing thoughts? Uh, one, I just, uh, like I say in my classes, guys, please, please, please go get some training. I don't, I'd love for it to be with Lone Star Medics, uh, but at least even if it's with my colleagues, my competitors, you're going to learn how to skin, skin that cat different ways. It's going to make you a better student and, uh, you know, better at saving lives. Um, so please continue your medical training. Please get out there. If you're a firearms instructor or a professional, then you for darn sure, you know, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire and hold you to a different standard, which we should. 
to our higher standard. And yes, you should have some medical training and planning before everything gets kicked off. Well, you know, I just had a thought occur, so I'm done for the week. Yeah, you know, it's Tuesday. I don't have to think of anything else. Um, <laughs> a lot of us in the firearms world, we take classes from this traveling big name instructor, that traveling big name instructor, whatever. Treat medical the same way. Take Caleb's class. Take Sherman's class. Take Carrie's class. Yeah. Go, yes. go, go take go take them all. And every one of you can get into because you're always going to be picking up stuff. And I, and, and then the first one you take, it's like the first shooting class that you took. Yeah. You picked up body valuable information, but if you go back and take that same class later, you're going to pick up more. So you know, each one of those things is going to be building in to your skill set. Uh, I took a first responder class, uh, law enforcement center that completed on a Friday. On Tuesday, I was the first guy in to a CPR situation. All right, so it, this is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> right, I, I'm gonna. I've got like our post note. You said stay on task, Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> don't get too passionate. Just right. Stay on task. But, but, but uh, folks, you know, take all these opportunities to, to to that are out there. Just look for them. They're not hard to find. You found shooting classes. If you're listening to this or watching it, you found this podcast. Found this one. <laughs> wow! Oh. And if you can find this one, you've got some really good Google skills. So, uh, or really would, bad, would, or really uh, bad ones. So. And I'm seeing, and I'll back what you were saying. Take those other classes and take them again. Uh, there's some, you know, like uh, our, our late friend William April. Mm-hmm. Out of all the firearms, I've got about just over 600 hours of self-defense. You know, firearms, edge weapons, mindset, or all of it. Uh, not so much legal. That's where I'm lacking in legal. Uh, classes of about 600 hours. Uh, I look back at all the years and I've got more hours spent in William April's mindset class than anything. And every time I've taken his, his unthinkable class, I learned something new. Mm-hmm. Same thing with, uh, you know, even you know, yours and Tom's classes, uh, Ashton Ray, uh, Carl, every time John Dobb and Carl and I are on the range, I'm learning something new. And I've mm-hmm. known those guys for, you know, 12 years. Um, and uh, I'm seeing I, I, what's really been interesting the past four years now I'm getting about a, a two or three alumni, uh, Lone Star Medic alumni in my class again. I'm like, why are you taking this one again? Caleb, it was three years ago, it was, it was five years ago when I took this class. I'm like, oh, yeah, some things have changed. Uh-huh. Uh, medicine changes, guys, by the minute, by the minute. Medicine t- uh, techniques and protocols and do's and don'ts change literally by the minute. Um, uh-huh. So what, what you took a year ago may not be so true anymore. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, again, I'll just say this in closing. Uh, yeah, people, please go out and take some training. I'd love to see you in a Lone Star Medics class, but I'll even love it better if you just go take somebody's a reputable instructor's class. Well, there you go. Uh, Caleb, thank you for your time today and, thank you uh, and, and your expertise and for the audience. Uh, thank you for your time. I know that it is uh, uh, your most valuable commodity. If you're enjoying this show, please uh, be sure to share the links in your social media or send it out in your email to all your friends, all two of them, and uh, uh, like, subscribe, whatever, all that kind of stuff. The professionals tell me that I'm supposed to do a call to action in every broadcast, and I'm far from a professional in this. I'm in my kitchen. So with that, I'm that Williams guy, and thank you for your time.